thank you all for being here. Um, we hope this to be in the presence of the Lord and to give us um, understanding that uh, the mind is a gift from God. And uh, when the mind uh, is used in some conclusions, uh, sometimes we have to um, ratify these conclusions are correct or not, or are logical or not, by the measure of science. So there is an outline that what we do is an act of love. It's not an act of dominion or uh, authority or authorship. Uh, it's just an act of love to give a viewpoint from the conclusions that have been made in science that would lead to some uh, conclusions of the absence of God. And since um, the work of God is the work of the church, so when God is uh, concluded to be absent, we'll say, okay, thank you, we'll take it from there, and we'll see with the absence of God, can life start on its own or not? Because if, uh, if um, God is claimed to be non-existent, then life has to spontaneously on its own start. So the, the presentation or the dialogue hopefully we have here is about uh, serving more than about, more than about debating. Um, faith and the intellect, uh, they are different uh, circles, as we'll see, but they have to interact together as we'll see what parts and how they interact. We'll have to discuss the history of life sciences and what were sciences looking for as the holy grail of science. And abiogenesis, and actually I will be trying a little bit, the DNA is a nemesis, in fact, for abiogenesis. Let's see what, what that is and how is that. Polymerase complicates the case um, because a biogenesis will require something called polymerase because um, there, is, there is reason for its need and it actually will make it even more complicated. DNA and protein synthesis, transcription, translation, and folding, cover this as well. Uh, and we have a break and we can take whatever we reach the point, which is at four o'clock. Information is unidirectional or bidirectional in, um, in the process of uh, protein synthesis. And that's very important to identify whether it's unidirectional or bidirectional. Um, chance plus time, this has been covered and it became almost conclusive, extremely improbable. And there's a very nice book that deals with this. It's called Undeniable by Douglas Axe, who's a PhD in molecular biology. It's very, it's very, uh, that's his work. And, uh, he, he did work in Cambridge, and then he's now, uh, uh, he's now actually in Bible University. Uh, and briefly, a uh, transcription, translation, similarity. This is what we discussed very briefly. How it's similar to digital communication systems. I just put a diagram there. I will not get into this. And also future work, feedback control systems and the presence of biology. And uh, the, the almost, I want to be just technical, the extreme improbability for feedback control systems to be built in an evolutionary way. They have, as we saw the diagram, they have to close on themselves from the very beginning to regulate what they are, what they are trying to regulate. So that's basically the outline. My, my, my book covered it all today. This is for the purpose of uh, recording. For the purpose of recording this to be reference for um, audience in the future or reference for discussion. This is under the evangelism department. And they obviously going, is going to be asked whether we believe in evolution or not. Uh, and, and in what qualification we believe in evolution if, if we do. And the bottom line, of course, we believe in it because evolution is the self-sustaining mechanism for species to continue without any external involvement for to modify it, till we were able to learn how to modify and where to modify. So evolution is a great act of proof of self-sustaining autonomous system that can continue on and on and on and on without external interference that it sustains itself. So this is a very, very big pointer that exists in the creation or it's existing in the species that, have, that that mechanism exists. So we acknowledge it does exist. It's not against the church. So what we're doing is an act of love. We'll talk about the faith and the intellect, history of life sciences, and what science was looking for 
abiogenesis and the DNA formation or the DNA presence is actually challenges abiogenesis very much, not actually sustaining for it. Polymerase will complicate this case even more. The DNA, how it's used in manufacturing protein, and that is what sustains the species. Information in this case is a bidirectional or unidirectional. Why is that important to understand whether it's unidirectional or bidirectional? Chance was trying to do all of this, extremely, extremely improbable. And I will show briefly two diagrams of future work, which is, um, in fact, a very com uh, common system in communication. Uh, there's a diagram for it, and it's very, very identical to how actually biology manufactures protein. Okay, so let's delve into it. Um, it's an act of mouth. Discussion and debate is an act that Christ went through willingly or unwillingly. He was pulled in discussion or in debate, or he went into it on his own to explain. For example, today was the parable of the sower, and to talk to the crowd and to talk to the also um, the crowd that is simple and yet very detailed religious discussions also with the Pharisees. So he talked in both fashions. Sometimes he was pulled into it by him being confronted, but he focused objectively, he did not uh, attack them, and they did attack him, but he focused objectively on the question and the debate with him. So we have to do this. Christ used parables as a method to explain. He used whatever tools we have now that the other person prefers and understands. So that's the act of love. We have to go with the person as it's sometimes rough uh, because the attitude is a little bit aggressive and antagonistic, but it doesn't, it, we have to accept that because we want to watch the feet. The mind is a gift to man from God. The love of Christ compels us to wash the feet, to offer an explanation. Uh, when we are accused, we explain. Second Corinthians, when St. Paul was supposed to accuse, he explained. He defended himself in an objective way without insulting the other point as they insulted him. Faith is a circle and the circle. And uh, if you please join the meeting, it's so good that you can mute the microphone. Um, they are separate till something happens, which is um, when science makes a conclusion from empirical facts that God doesn't exist. This is the circle of faith. When science concludes that God doesn't exist, the faith answers what answers from science, not from the faith. That is the part that is uh, crucial. That's the washing of the feet. But the science is a subset of the intellect. The intellect does more things than just science. And the intellect capability has logic and has abstraction. You can think in, in, abstract, in an abstract way about the problem or about yourself, about your future. It has nothing to do with science um, or logic of deduction. It does, you abstract yourself and you start analyzing yourself, thinking of yourself, your condition. This is a, a work of the intellect. Of course, I will not be a religious because the, the spirit has a big part in this abstraction, but we'll, we'll constrain our work mainly to um, the science. Today we're going to discuss mainly this. There is other talks for the logic, how to apply it to uh, logical deduction uh, about whether this Christianity movement is man-made or, or not. But that's not discussed, of course, today. Example of these things, actually, Anthony and I work on these things quite a bit um, in another context, but to be useful about apologetics, which is if you want to see the effect of a drug on, on, a, on the life of the person, the lifespan of a person. So this out of means this affects this. But there's other external effects that could also affect this, and you cannot ignore them. So there's a certain, certain type of of mathematics called belief networks and probability, conditional probability that handles uh, this provided this and provided this and, provided, and how everyone affects and if these affect one another. This probabilistic deduction, in fact, um, can be used to uh, build a diagram to see if it's Christianity man made or not. That's uh, um, done already, um, but I'm not presenting it, of course, today. But I'm saying that the intellect has other power just besides empirical science of the lab, the power of drawing such diagrams of what affects what, 
And this is in fact in, uh, in science or in mathematics or in probability is called belief networks. What affects what somebody, by how much does it affect it? And it's under the study of conditional probability. So I summarize the whole architecture is into level four levels, level one, which we went in here today, subset of it, the science, history, logic, philosophy, and this deals with if you remove God, what would happen? So we're discussing since God is removed, we'll see from science if things if life can happen on its own. Don't worry about this now, just present it for the sake of, the, of inclusion of the of the, the, the bigger picture of apologetics, which is not just sparse, but actually a certain architecture that I, I used to guide the whole apologetics scene. We're here today, but these are discussed, all of them, to build a probabilistic case whether God exists or not. And if he does exist, in which case? And we can get into, um, after that, we get into how to compare faith together. And if the probabilistically that handles the view, the view, uh, view point of the world, or the world viewpoint of Christianity, then we get into which Christianity, and here we discuss whether communion is real or symbolic, because this is the bottom line between the different Christianities that are available. I mean, <clears throat> whether communion is real or symbolic. So we're here today. In level one, level four is what the church does 80 or 90 percent work of, which is uh, the service that uh, getting deeper in our apostolic faith, Orthodox and Catholic, the sacraments, the church fathers. We 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 love we love being here. We love being here, but maybe unintentionally putting this down here. We have to wash the feet also at this. Event. This is the head, and we're enjoying this part. We have to get down. To wash the feet in, in the class, which is about 16 lectures long. This actually takes half of it. Eight, eight sessions of the, without even discussing philosophy is spent here. And then one lecture people that train students how to compare, and two here. And then there's if, if one week is left, and we don't use the class projects. We discuss either the schism chalcedon or we discuss how to understand the natural epistles and how to use all that thing within the church. So that's of course a pleasure for all of us, but it is mandatory for us to work on this level as well. Um, so there are two different areas, faith and science. So now I, I reduce the intellect mainly for today to be science. Faith is philosophical or metaphysical, where the latter and the science is empirical and based on ex experiments. Then faith has to answer the metaphysical assertion when science concludes, this is a conclusion, science tells faith you're useless because God doesn't exist. So it's a conclusion from here that God doesn't exist. So since this is a metaphysical conclusion, then we have to answer. And the answer is not by authority, but by watching the feet of the science. Tell them, okay, this science that you used to prove the non-existence, we're gonna tackle it and see how we make those conclusions, and we'll discuss whether it's a, uh, we can we can actually view, make a viewpoint uh, to to um, to prove otherwise. And I'm not saying I'm going to prove God's existence. I'm going to prove that the conclusion or show that the conclusion of his non-existence will create problems scientific. His non-existence will create problems scientific. So the two main scientific assertions: evolution is a fact. And the Big Bang is a fact. They are, they are facts, in fact, but they, they, they completely went beyond the borders. I'll show you in the diagram. Not the Big Bang today, but evolution. The conclusion of these two facts, very clearly, there's no God. That is just a, if evolution accounts for the origin of life or tackles the origin of life, and the Big Bang accounts for the origination of the universe, then Definitely, that is such a simple conclusion. It, it takes a child to do this uh, assertion. So the answer back is staying here, not from the Bible into here, staying in here. The reference is not to answer science from the Bible, because the Bible is not, is not intended to be a scientific book, but rather to use the implications of the conclusions. 
the Bible mentions some things pertaining to science, um, but it's not in the context of three, especially Genesis 1, how to read it correctly. So evolution theory expanded its the observations that the origin of life itself existed from external factors. Cosmology means the Big Bang happened on its own by itself, self creation of the universe. Therefore, there's no creator, there's no initiator. So if we prove scientifically, the world cannot deal with the probabilistic law. And I, will, I present the case, not just take them out. So this is what we're discussing today. If the claim for evolution that probably is very sketchy to account for the origin of life, cosmology also will show that the universe of the Big Bang needs conditions for it to happen, then we're going to have, there could be an initiator for life and for the universe. So this is the approach. Um, origin of living matter, origin of matter, Big Bang. These two are interrelated. The focus will be here today because this requires a little bit of study of the history of physics and when things were absolute and became um, relative and why it become relative more suitable. It's this is this is this topic is very, very hard. So I'll stick to what the topic of is today, which is in relation to the evolution that we So let's do some things that happened in science. We'll discuss the search for transfer of traits of the offspring. This is this became the holy grail of science. How do the children get traits from the parents? This became the holy grail of science. People were not debating the origin of life. They were believers at that time. It doesn't matter if it's not the case of it. This is why we're here. We're going to discuss. But all of science search mean is how and where, where the information is stored to transfer things from the parents to the children. That's why I'll get into quite a bit today for this part. It doesn't matter. Uh, we'll stop wherever we stop, but this has to be understood because it, it gives the mind of the scientists what are they thinking, what are they looking for. Observational evolution, that's Darwin's theory. And then the discovery of DNA, because there is things happen between these two and mislocation of where the information is stored, we need to cover this. And the discovery of the DNA did something, did major, major breakthroughs that we have to acknowledge and we have to celebrate in genetics. This is something we cannot be blind to, the genetics advancement. When the genetics advancement happened, which is this is really kind of tracking the history of life sciences, Always in this room. This this gets in the backstage. In the backstage means what? Well, now if you want to be a scientist, really, really the focus is here. This stuff, even if you don't give it enough attention or enough solid evidence, that, as we we'll we we'll see today, it doesn't matter. That's the part that we're well, now the church gets trampled, or the science gets. Science will discover it, science will discover it. As you guys used to attribute God to everything, and it turns out that there's scientific explanation for it. So now we're going to see the scientific explanation for the origin of life after discovering the DNA becomes very, very important to discuss it here. So science uses the very accelerated machine that happens in this area, especially there, to give a feedback signal that if you give any simple or any explanation that life started on its own, science will accept it because it will say two things. Advancement in genetics gives us so much effort in evolution. Second thing, science will, show, will cover these gaps in the future. We didn't, we, we, we don't worry about this now. At, at some point, but at some point, science will, 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 will cover this, and I'll show you what science needs to cover. So this is exactly what happens in the scientific arena. The origin of life takes a backstage. You can hypothesize on it all day long and, and use this term, but science will find a way to explain all of the gaps of the 
will find a way to explain all of this. So when it's just about Genesis, the person discussing will found that my arguments were very solid. This is the, the part where I want to reach is that the presentation to somebody doesn't look trivial, doesn't look simple, doesn't look churchy. This is the part that I tested the discussions with the person about. Is that it doesn't, doesn't look for the person, this is not a priest presentation or a, or a sermon. So I look for that very, very feedback, very important, and thank God with time with multiple people like this, and they think through it. Sometimes they buy into what one, one person did, and one person still in the process. If she too did, um, I was hoping that they would make several conclusions about it, but they believe in the existence of God, but the next step after wasn't taken. But it's okay. It's okay. At least, at least they did not be the existence of God. Um, as the case was also a, a very wonderful deacon that was about to leave, and then the discussion also called him back, and he still uh, came back to deacon ship and, and stayed in the church. There's a very beloved person discussing with now. He's, he gave that the arguments that are very, very solid, but then he always say that we are, um, there is science will cover the ambiguities of the foundry. So I'm going to give you the ambiguities of the foundry, and you judge for yourself. Um, so there is a lot of chance. This is one of the immediate thing that gets gets um, put back in your face. Chance found a way to form what I will show you, and that's very, very, very unlikely. And I have evidence from it from atheists also that says that chance would find are not enough to form what the complexity of life at the very beginning. So, so this is why this is why it's important to understand this diagram is that. The advancements here makes us completely this is like old and archaic. And if you want to like open this box, don't worry about it. Science will find a way to extend it in the future, and then uh, the case is closed. So I wanted to open that case. So the flow of the argument: um, <clears throat> if God doesn't exist, okay, then we'll take it. This is what you left us with. Therefore, we have to um, only forces of nature, because there's no creator has to be behind the origin of life and also forces of nature, uh, but there's the big bang has to make it self, self nuclear or happen on some, but that's not the problem for today. So we take where you left off. You made this conclusion first, great. Then that conclusion means that we have to discuss the life start by itself or not. And that's where we're going to give some arguments for. Let's revise the evolutionary theory of Darwin quickly. It has four tenets. Individual variation. This is what he discovered, and I will show you in the history of science where he lies. Individual variations are exhibited in individual organisms within each population of species. These variations are due to mutations. Mutations are generally beneficial, making the organism more suited for their environment. Heritability due to natural selection, organisms with advantageous traits will have greater probability of success in reproducing. Number three, difference between generations, the individuals that will survive against harsh conditions and have ability to reproduce will create a new generation of offspring, which are with more favorable traits than their predecessors. This mechanism adaptations will increase the survivability and reproducibility. Over reproduction, crowding, crowding of the species will render the resources of the environment relatively more scarce compared to the species population size, leading to the organism with advantageous traits. They will eventually pass the traits to their offspring. They show that the fittest only will survive the natural selection. These are the four tenets of the evolution theory. We'll leave it at that, but let's get into stations on the journey of science. Life. Life was obsessed, or science was obsessed with this question. Transfer of traits from parents to children and the origin of life and evolution. So the holy grail of science was not really focused on how life started, but how life propagates from the parents to children. The first, Traits transfer and life. This is the major station that needs to be asked, or that, 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 that form a conclusion. 
these are the stepping stones to get to the next one. In the 18th century, where is the life of the organism? Where are the information stored? How is the information transferred? Uh, Robert Hooke in 1665, this is a major landmark, the cell, the discovery of the cell. And then that's earlier than the 18th century, towards the end of the 70th. Robert Hooke and Theodore Schwann, Matthias Jacob Schneider, 1938 to 1930, discovery and identification of the role of the cell. There's actually something living that's very tiny. Of course, let's see. In the 19th century, again, the search is passing traits. We found that the traits have to be in the cell because the organism is composed of cells. So this is reduction or the transfer, another the big station to stand on. Passing traits from parents to children, the search is on for an answer to the this propagation of life, not origin of life, propagation of life question. This month, Gregory Mendel discovered that actually hereditary information is digital. It's not like mixing two things together, like yellow and blue, and you get the bluish yellow per person or a yellowish blue person. No, it's actually digital. This is actually a major, major statement. When you make information of inheritance to be Four letters. It's a combination of these. This is not my background of study, but this is major, major thing relative when you understand digital system and discover that the hereditary information is segregated. It's not in the launch between two things that you put together. This means that traits are described by discrete information. They are not continuous, like mixing two things, blue and yellow, continuous together to get the blue or yellow or yellow or blue. So in the history of science, this was a major discovery. So now that we know that things are in the cell, we know that the inheritance in the cell is represented digitally, upper X, upper case X and Y, and lower case X and Y. And then now the search is very, very intense. Where in the cells are these deep states? Comes Darwin with observation, a very, very uh, smart observation that we just described about the traits are passed, the heritability and the survival of the fittest and the change in the species becomes mutation. And then that's how another species starts coming from the first one. So he presents this theory in 1859. Natural selection and mutation part published on the origin. This is the first time we start hearing the word origin of the species. How things started. And it became the de facto standard because there's a macro engine happening called survival of the fittest. And it, and it proved it, and it's true, it's very true. But then he backtracks, he discovers something here, and then he can go backwards and say, based on this discovery, now I know that things started from the beginning. By a single cell, because it's now finished, concluded that things are in the cell. So he observed what happens at the um, Earth level or at the creation already level. And then he said, now I can say that things happen from the beginning. Certain cell came into existence. And then with this mechanism, it started differentiating into existence of other cells, hence other species, and so on. That's the tree of life, in fact, that he has drawn as a result of um, the theory. So the theory used something observable to conclude what is not observable. Is everybody clear so far? Everybody clear so far? That's where the switch happened. This became now the um, reliance on, now we know that evolution accounts for the origin. This is how the link happened. Is evolution as a process, now we'll take it to account for the abiogenesis. Abiogenesis is now the things to exist spontaneously. And this became the thrust of science that we just discussed as the beginning. And then people focus on the advancement of genetics, 
And then once in a while, if you want to discuss this, they throw it on the back of science and say science will find a way as you got as you guys covered, God with every gap and then later on in science explained. But that's I'm going to show just from science uh, without discussing any um I'll present the case for you and we'll see if it's not okay. The cell it didn't um at the time at the time of Charles Darwin, the let me read this far as the computer story. The birth of the term origin has been a conclusion from the observed process of propagation of traits. So propagation of traits and how what we see in evolution. But he introduced in his uh, writing origin of the species. So now I'm saying that this actually can talk about how things all started. And he added the concept of a seed of cells starting everything. And this is backward in time deduction. Similar to geological deductions about the past of observing the Earth's formations. Uh, Lyon, who was a great geologist at the time of Darwin, used the same mechanism to so see something at the moment, observe it, and conclude from it what happens in the past. We we'll do this also in cosmology. We will see the expansion of the universe and we can conclude when the, how long ago the Big Bang was. And that's why the, 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 the theorizing was about uh, 14 billion years ago. These are all very good scientific processes. But the presence of the single cell, this is, the, this is what we'll discuss. What, what, how is that um, scientifically very improbable? Actually, I'll show you, I'll show you a little bit about the cell, majorly in 1844. And Walter Fleming, focusing on the chromosomes, discovery of cell division process. Nobody needs to look anywhere else. This is focus, laser focus on the cell. Don't look anywhere else. Focus on the cell. Where is the information stored? And the science now is such an addiction and rush with this, with this, let's find where it is and how it is connected. So the major landmark is the aggressive search for what specific carries the traits information. Where is it? Where is it stored? Components and conclusions. This is the beginning of the next stations. Nuclear discovery. Friedrich Meitner in 1869 isolated what he called nuclear, a new molecule from the cell nucleus. That's why he called the nuclear. In the 20th century, The first half of the 20th century, early 1900s, has been very, very, very big, important landmark. Discovered nucleotides had some common and some different constituents. The common elements are phosphate and the oxide, both sugar. The different elements which lead to the different among the four nucleotides are nitrogenous six elements, and they are called the four elements now cytosine, adenine, thymine. And go on. Found the four nucleotides, Levine in the 1900s. Later on, he found the amino acids in the early 1920s, different types of them. So he found the DNA and the RNA, the components of it, and he found the amino acids. But this is 20 and this is four. What do you think he concluded? What do you think he concluded as well? The, remember, the question is. Where are the information of hereditary information stored? What do you think he was he concluded? What they are stored in the amino acid or they are stored in the these four components? What would his mind his mind lead him to and why? Hmm? No, the 20 because they're a larger number, you can have more combinations. Combinations out of four is very limited. You can have more combinations even if you want to carry the traits of something. You need more capacity to store the bits of what each thing is. So he said it has to be in the amino acid. Hmm? Environment for the four? No, it's just numbers. He said it has to be a bigger number to store more information. That's basically like one kilobyte versus one megabyte. That's that basic as that. <laughs> exactly. It's not enough to store in four combinations. He had no clue. He had no clue. Actually, he drew a picture of what the DNA looks like. 
but I'll show you the picture. It's, it's something different. And that's actually would be the core of the, of the however long it takes, because I probably have to stop earlier than what I allocated as uh, good. I will have more material to present over the next session. So what's your name? Thomas. Yes, Thomas. The, the four were not enough combination to store all of these traits. I have no clue. I had no clue the building of it, but this is exactly now. My, my when you see how he concluded how they are connected, you'll see that the picture he had in mind was completely wrong. But again, this is this is like so smart because this is we didn't know. Now we can tell that easily they were wrong, but but you're you're looking into the future, you have no idea. But if you make this conclusion, this was just a sheer number. These are many more than this, so this can carry more complications. So the landmark here proteins, amino acid chains, proteins, amino acid chains carries the information, not the DNA. That's his conclusion. Amino acids, not DNA or RNA. They've been early 1900s, 20 different five present, present more variations than just four nucleotides, and also amino acids are more configurable. Well, they, you can change the order of them. You can come up with different properties. Oh, wow, this is perfect. I can actually have more numbers and I can change the order of them. Then this has to carry the traits of the person or the traits of the species, sorry. And also amino acids are more configurable than fixed connections of nucleotides, i.e. 20 versus four, fixed connections, because they have affinity. I think it means what we discovered that, of course, the, the adenine attracts to thymine and cytosine. So, right, so you see to go in and then add the to, to sign in. I'm not sure if you discovered because of the growing, I will show you a challenge with this. In any case, 20, 20 configurable, different order is more important or more, um, more probable candidate than four fixed. So he drew it fixed. This was the drawing he came up with. I don't know if you can see it or not, but so. Put speed bombing. And the order is cytosine, adenine, guanine, thymine, and it repeats cytosine, adenine, guanine, thymine, I, um, cytosine, adenine, guanine, thymine. So it's, it's a very fixed order that this is what the DNA to him looked like. And that's why he said this cannot carry the traits. So now we're still going. We said in the 20th century, this is recent, but not far ago. Discovery that DNA carries hereditary information. The transforming principle, this is an American, actually, landmark of Oswald Avery and Friedrich different Griffiths. Ability to transform, convert a certain type of bacteria from being harmless to being harmful, violent, violent, not violent, violent. Genes and proteins correspondence. George, George Edel, at in parallel, found that the genes carry the direction for making one protein. These are working independently. The transforming principle led to zooming in on the DNA. Because now, if you take a species and turn it from a certain characteristic of being harmless, and you can feed it something, and you make it harmful, you did not play with the protein of the species, you played with the DNA. And that's that's what's called in the in the biology history the transforming principle that you're able to transform, you're able to modify the species from harmless to violent. This is that's why this is the event mark. 1920, believe that this is just 100 years ago. 1923. Are we wrong? 2023. 2023. 2023. Removing the candidates. So, um, led to the zoom in on the DNA and in the new time, eliminating the RNA because it's not stable. It's not, we haven't discussed the connectivity of it and the stability. Sorry, the, the structure of the DNA. They just now they moved the gene wrong. Very brilliant person, of course. And they removed the amino acids and they made it focus on the DNA. We don't know how the DNA looks like, but from the external 
experimentation, they were able to modify. They don't know how it's modified. They don't know the ladder shape. They don't know any of the affinity or the building of That's not known yet. All of these decisions, in, in some in parallel and some, of course, consequential. Uh, sequential. Bacteria also carried DNA. Joshua Lederberg, 1945, Alfred Hershey, and Martha Chase also were able to discover that DNA also existed. Everything, even the very tiniest thing, the bacteria, always carries DNA. This is far beyond Darwin. Darwin was macro observation. Now we're here, it's this is the sequence. Now we're here, it's in the cell. The cell at the time of Darwin is a piece of dot called nucleus, has cytoplasm, and has a membrane. That's it. It doesn't function any, it's just pieces together to form the organism. Later on, it was discovered that it carries the, the, the hereditary information, and later on, it was discovered it's in the DNA, which is a uh, major advancement. Again, not knowing the affinity, Irvin Chagas research showed that the ratio of A to T. And that of G to C is constant in all living things. It doesn't know they connect. But I said when I measure A to T ratio and G to C ratio, it's one to one in all living things. This is this is again huge discovery. I'm giving the landmarks. So DNA carries. The full hereditary information of the species. Genes are made of DNA. DNA not protein is the genetic module. So now completely information is not stored in the protein, it is stored in the DNA. Now we get to another stage or another step. How does the molecule contain the hereditary information? And this led to the destruction of the DNA. So let's get into this step. Rosalind Franklin has done crystallography um, and published her result in Nature of how the shape of the DNA molecule looks like. It's not Watson and Crick. In fact, she discovered from X ray crystallography and she got into ovarian cancer and she passed away in her 30s. And she published the result in the same. Article where Francis and Crick published also the result of, but there's interaction that happened. And she went to the lab, and her boss took some the results and showed it to them. And there's a big, big story that's happened around that time. In any case, this is the beginning of that trip, and it led to the discovery of the helical structure of the molecule. It looks like a twisted pattern, as you're all familiar with the shape of the DNA uh, helical structure. This is how. We have advanced so far. So now, in order to frame our correction correctly, because in mathematics or science, if you frame the problem correctly, this is almost 60 or 70% of solving it. So the origin of life, I want to get your full attention with this part. The origin of life, since we found that all the life of organisms is encoded in the DNA, and later on with transcription translation, we'll see transcription translation basically for you who don't have the background, which I didn't, is to take the DNA and pieces of it, puts it in the machinery that gives you from the outside protein. That's called transcription and translation into protein. We'll describe it because this is one of the very strong um, questions um, of how these machines can come together. So the correct scientific question about the origin of life, how life started, is exactly the same question of how the first DNA molecule was built. Because we discovered from the science history that life of the species is all encoded here. So this has to come into existence. But it's theories that protein came into existence first and led to the DNA would answer all of this as part of the presentation. But I cannot get further from this point to I get your full conviction that the origin of life means the origin of DNA. Does that make sense? Yes? It's not a meme, it's, this is not liturgy. 
It's not Kito Gavmati, so <laughs> I'll say it again. The trip of science we had today discovered that the species is fully encoded in a molecule called the DNA. Means that you know the whole knowledge about this thing by knowing its DNA structure. Right? Therefore, for life to start, then it has to start with the DNA coming into existence. Now, DNA is the, is the organism. Nobody exists without a DNA. And DNA is a molecule. So when, when Darwin said the first cell came and satiated into whatever, you got the question here, how does the cell, first cell come into existence? Hmm? Okay. 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 Somehow, this somehow what I'm going to shoot arrow, shoot arrows on that it cannot happen. So that, that what you said is the abiogenesis material, which we don't know where it came from. Came in, I'm not doing this sarcastically. Came into certain presence of pressure, temperature, and then these proteins led to the arising of RNA, which led to the DNA. Okay. So all of this by natural force, right? Okay, so the question I'm asking matches yours is that how can the DNA come into existence on its own with whatever it produced with, with amino acid before and RNA? Selection. Okay. Mahal, that's about the part where you throw, the, the words are thrown without scientific support. Because we've seen, if you're biology background, which I'm not, we'll, we'll, we'll see different challenges to this. I will give you a couple of challenges, depending on the time. I have to be able to say one before the break. You cannot leave it at this point. But at least we agree that the origin of life is the DNA, how DNA came into existence, right? Because that's what maintains species, how to support the food, how to replicate, exactly, which is, which is life. It's not the wrong, we're not going to discover something. Well, let's see. I can see this <laughs> dangerous thing. It's the, the identity that carries both fully the species and parts of it builds the protein that supports the species to live. Make sense? That's the smaller, the, the, smaller, the size that, that makes it numerical. It's like it has all the info. All the info that defines you from A to Z, or whatever it is from A to Z. So the origin of living things is can DNA come into existence by natural forces? Yeah, when I'm going. To... No, no, no. I want you. To, I want us to believe in this because natural forces. I mean, protein came before it, see, uh, pressure came before it, and so on to build it. Okay. That's the reason why you don't need to apply the bar. Anthony, can you say that again? So, I, I'm Anthony. Um, Father Gregor and I work together on a lot of projects. I'm, a, I'm an astrophysicist by training. Um, but I what Father Gregory is saying, I mean, this is why NASA has a mission to Mars right now. Point. It's like, are the conditions on Mars uh, uh, similar to actually create DNA? And this has been, I mean, it's a probe that's sent up to Europa soon that my son is working on right now to drill through the ice cap of Europa to see if there's life down there. But when I define life, what they're looking for is the Father Gregory is actually defining his. See so our conditions that are available, pressure, temperature, and you ask, it's all that to create DNA. So to your point, this is what's been uh, the drive for NASA to see their life on the planet. I'll just add to Father Gregory's point. If you look at statistically, if this was a common occurrence, we'd be seeing life all over the galaxy. But we don't. Um, and it would be present to see, especially all the universe is in existence. So um, 
Anyway, just one. Sorry. No, 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 great. great. I'd like, like more input, please. Okay, so I'll get into the point here with um, focusing a little bit on the DNA, or actually a lot of the DNA to argue this point. So I'm going to summarize what I said. Fact DNA contains all the information that encodes the species. Fact this information is passed on to the children, withstanding some changes in patients. Um, fact claimed by science that DNA came into integration by some natural process, amino acid plus temperature plus things. Some natural process, no external agent means no God, of course. That's the whole that's the whole point. I mean external agent mean an intelligent agent to put it together. Therefore, the correct scientific quest is to investigate the presence of forces of nature or items that can be put together by nature on its own to build the DNA. Can basically we we'll say amino acids existed? These amino acids you have to add to it some type of I'll say forces to build forces that things have to be attracted to hold themselves together, some just the structure. And this force, in fact, is called in, in biology biochemistry because the attraction forces in biology to hold things together is affinity called biochemical, biochemical affinity. And we it's found. Affinity means things are fine to one another, you're attract, attracted to one another. And in fact, it was found in the DNA that the A has affinity to the T, and the C has affinity to the G. This is just an example of a strand or a small two parts of the DNA. And this goes on very long, as you know, its length in humans is discovered at to be 3.2 billion. We call it letters, we call these together letters. This is one letter, this is one letter, one letter. Three billion letters long. So it's not small. And you cannot miss part of it. I'm not discussing the junk DNA, and, the, and there's, there's so many details. And why is there as X entrons and exons? And this is there's so many details that actually will support it, that the details in it are un, 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 unsurmountable. But what I'm going to give today in the next 10 minutes, just to show that biochemical affinity, which is the forces of nature that can build things together in biology. Biochemical affinity means the chemistry in biology that things are attracted chemically to one another. That's why we see in the DNA, the A is attracted to the T and the C is attracted to the G. This one. Agree to this part? Agree to this part. Okay. So I'm, I'm rephrasing this just to have it in the slides. What do you mean by natural forces? Natural forces in biology are the affinities described in the field of biochemistry, biochemical affinity. Okay, what is the DNA? As we said, Rosalind Franklin, you got this for Saul because she did all the work and she died because of it with cancer. Um, and say and published it, but thank God that he captured the name of the work on X ray crystallography. So, the DNA molecule, the, the major discovery that happened by Watson and Crick is that the helical shape of it, it, it looks like it has a it's structure, it has a mechanical structure. This mechanical structure has advantages, I will not get into, into that. And this is the order, if you undo it, I'm just making it here um, straight to become clearer. So the information, as we said, that the information of the species is in this direction, this direction, not this direction. It's in this direction. So this species, part of it has this information, A, G, P, C, A, T, G, A. I just read these. The DNA has a mechanism to repair itself, so this gets damaged because A only attaches to a T, 
sound mechanism, but I'm ignorant of it, I don't care for it, happens to detect this and brings a T connects here because there is magnetic attraction or biochemical attraction between them. Has to it to repair, to replicate, and so on. But it will never, it will never, unless you have genetic engineering that you can change this affinity. I know this one. Just maybe it was, I thought the genetic engineering was to take part of this and put another part of the same affinity, but it depends on the trying to make the A affine to something else other than the T, according to my understanding what she's studying. So for now, or what we know from science and what everybody acknowledges in science, this is how the DNA is. This is the order of information. This is the connections that happens as the biochemical affinity. And this is very long and it defines fully whether this is cockroach, whether this is a banana, whether this is an elephant, whether this is a human, this is what the DNA does. Clear so far? Clear so far? Okay. I came forward. This is magic. <laughs> I thought you left. I said, well, wow, they missed at this the, <laughs> the core point. <laughs> so, so I'm very pleasantly surprised that you're forward here. <laughs> no, my pleasure. I appreciate the interest. I really do. Okay, moving on. This is an example that actually was done for second graders and third graders at Agis Apologetics for kids. No, Agis kids, just to show that. And they know what I think mean, that fourth graders are five to fifth graders, they know about DNA and this. this I show them that. This will be picked up all of this in the DNA. So anyway, this is this this uh, this order part of a chimpanzee. Uh, what I showed you before it's like vertical. If I put it horizontal, just basically if I display this, if I display this horizontally, you will get these shapes of the next page. So this is clear that basically every species is fully defined by its DNA molecule. Okay, here is the most important question that I think will take rest after, but we cannot take rest before. I, let's say I am standing at this strand here where the A is connected to a T. Be ready for, the, for this question. They have an affinity, biochemical affinity, which is a hydrogen bond connecting the A to the T. The adenine to theamine, I think. I don't really take on studying the names. If I show you that I am standing at this, and you don't know, you don't see this at all. I, I said, I am, a, I am at, this, at the strand of A and T in the DNA molecule. Can you tell me based on biochemistry? Because biochemistry is the only forces of nature that can operate on things. We agree here. Forces of nature to build, build from what I don't care. Forces of nature to build are the biochemical forces. And there's a, this is the only forces that exist. And in 1968, it was called biochemical predestination. By, by Kenyon, Simon and Kenyon. So biochemical affinity is the hero behind biology. So can you, with your knowledge of biochemistry, which appears here that A attracts to B and C attracts to G, can you tell me what's coming next? Who said no? What does that mean? Hmm? Well, let me rephrase it. No, no, I'm saying very simple statements. Forces of nature are called forces of nature, natural forces. Forces of nature 
in physics is magnetism, electromagnetics. This is intrinsics. In biology, what are the forces of nature? Biochemistry. So based on biochemical affinity that we know, knowing that this is 80, can you tell what the 80 will bring after it? No. What does that mean? It means that biochemistry has no hand in forming the sequence. The horizontal is, is understood. It's deterministic A to T and C to G. But the vertical one, which is the one we're interested in, why? Because the vertical one will define this, what the species is. There is no forces of nature that can form it on its own. So it creates this. Exactly, where does that manual come, comes from? Well, that's, a, that's the answer we don't want to say. But the question, we, we leave it with the question. The direction that has information of the species doesn't have forces to form the information of the species doesn't have natural forces to form the information. In fact, go ahead. There, there is no biochemical affinity. There is no natural forces that can tell me, first of all, where did I come from? And the one before it, I don't know it. And where I'm going, forces of nature cannot form it. Exactly, well, this is about the argument of, that's why it's in the future. Even from the beginning, in my argument in the presentation, I cover this, which is chance of making this happen. Even here is this is Kenyon himself said, because an atheist and he said biochemical predestination is what made all of this. But nobody thought about this. They started thinking about because actually of communication theory. This is Claude Shannon theory of the, of the sequence of information. So it's it's the engineering field of digital communication is what made us look at biology as digital. If computers were not invented, if digital information were not invented and we sit in the analog field, we would not have been able to look at biology digital. I, I know this is what only engineers would appreciate this. But for that, that's why I didn't want to get too picky about this. I wanted to leave it at this with this question. I cannot tell. There is no natural forces that can tell me when I have a stand of 80, then tell me what's coming this. Therefore, natural forces did not do or did not design the sequence. Randomness, but we'll discuss that's a different session. Randomness, of course, method polymerase, where did it come from? The one that forms the DNA, and all of these things. The system is not that simple. So, but I want to get this across. Moreover, moreover, if if there is chemical affinity, and if this AT has attraction to the one after it, it has to be PA, because A attracts T. I mean, the. Yeah, but we'll hear about these forces. That's why we don't know what this is. We don't, we don't have forces to tell you what's coming next. A cannot attract something here. That's why this can be anything. It can be another AT, or it can be CG, or it can be GC, or it can be TA. Right? Exactly, they, they connect on the horizontal level. So the fact that I, that at some point when I'm standing here, I cannot tell by natural forces what's coming next. If a natural forces cannot maintain this, I am adding another argument. If you put, if you assume, and you want to say no, 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 for sure there is natural forces. Okay, let's assume there is. What does, what does it attract? Tracks to T. What does T attract? Tracks to A. What does A attract? Tracks to T. Yes, then. Yeah. 
was going to say that if it follows this structure, then the double helix shape disappears. Yeah, there's no more pots that have uncoiled, uncurls, and now you cannot get it out. You can't get the bonds and you can't get the heretic theory. There's no more organism. This is why exactly this is a teamwork, not just me working, because I look from an angle or I come from something called communication theory, which is the, the, the freedom of putting information. I will only show you this example without using digital communication. So, but what I feel really was allowed or what the computer field gave us the ability to think digitally. I will go back and think that it's really 1948 was called China theory of communication. And 1952 was the heavy construction. So digital systems took a path from analog systems. Biology took a direction to discover the DNA. It turns out when you understand the digital system really well, you will understand biology really well. And that's why I don't have background in biology, but this jumps out of the page. This is the digital has so many traits. And there's actually a book by somebody called TNA to the eyes of a coder. And there's comments, and there's why there's entrance and exons, and it's comment in the coder. And that un unreal that comes when you're coding. This is randomness. This is order. So although both, both are attracted to the, to the board with magnetic material, and the M is attracted to the magnet, the same as the Q, and it's the same here, but these are two different things. So the order, the natural forces here is open chemistry, the natural forces here is magnetism, the attraction of a letter that's magnetic to a board that's made of, um, made of iron. That's the, that's the biochemistry of this. But this is completely different than this. Although this may have the same small similarity, some of the letters are there. I'll give you another example. This is also the, your freedom, your freedom to put any, any letter. I will see the next part and I uh, will end and I will. Um, Send it home. I wish you a Merry Christmas. This one, the first book is my name is you write the I, space, wish, space, and so on. This one, the writer is free to use any letter without any forcible rule on the sequence of the letters, other than the rules of English, of course, have the verb of the subject and then the object and so on. But you can put any order you want. There's nobody finding you that you cannot put any letter. This enables the writer you to write any word with no restriction, such as air, elephant, soy, funding, whatever it is. Hence, the writer was able to write a message, I wish you a Merry Christmas. Let's take, let's take this too. I wished you a Merry Christmas because I put a rule of biochemical predestination that after every S, the T. If I write this vertically with DNA, I wish, but it says when you see an S vertically now, you have to put a T after it. There's an affinity here, like the A to the T, a different thing with this, the letter T. What did that what happened here? Two things happened. Just, just describing what I did. The first thing. Is that the writer will not be able to write all the words which has spelling of the letter S followed by any other letter than T. Once I see an S, I have to put the T. I lost the freedom. That's the example that I gave when you have an AT and you have an affinity in this direction, you have to put it. But it turns out there is no affinity. In the direction of writing the sentence, because the DNA is a sentence, long sentence, long sequence. We've so seen it with the slide of the elephant and, and the chimpanzee and so on. So this gives us an, it gives us an, a feeling. What do I need to be free to write whatever you want? So when I impose on your writing that you every S has to be attached to a T, which is biochemical predestination in the direction of information. This is the direction of information because you have to read vertically to form the sentence. 
I wish you a and so on. So the first thing, there are certain words I cannot find. There are certain species that cannot exist. The species are a book, are a sequence of letters. Second thing, this is from the communication theory of Sharon. The letter doesn't give me any extra information. In fact, if I erase it, and I tell you that the rule, after every S comes a T, then once you see the S here, what's the probability of seeing the T? One. Anything with probability one has no information. And information is not just a word, it's not information technology, it's information theory, but it's, it's really the only grain of understanding the theory. Yes. Saying that there is no structure, therefore, therefore, there's nothing telling you to put whatever order you want. Therefore, it has to be random. It's random. Well, it, has to be random. it has to be free. It has to be free. If it is free, then why isn't it random? Why isn't it just a mess? Why did it even come together? Exactly, time? exactly. So it's like, is, is, is that a lot? Of it? Or is a lot? Of yeah, so if it's a lot, of it, how can you even believe that? Anything cause DNA to come together, to come together, to come together. It's also impossible to believe that, right? Makes sense then. Yeah. Okay, great. Because you can't believe that everything goes towards randomness, but and then also believe right. that everything goes towards order. Right, exactly. But in order not to confuse people with randomness, just use this example of the vertical dimensional information. It has to be free. It means natural forces cannot form the order. That's it. And you add more to it, if there were natural forces, there will be nothing. No, 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 there will be the ATTA because you're clamped. The whole thing is clamped. Like I cannot write any English word. There's two, like words that are together. I don't have freedom. Right? It relates so much, but exactly as writing a book. A book is an ordered information. I, space, can I put the space after an I? You can put whatever you want. You can put whatever you want. Randomness forming the system was randomness. That's the rest of the talk, but you, you answer it. You cannot, you cannot have something random. They get to this fully organized speciation with organs, with functionality, with building proteins. And we see the building proteins machine. It, it's it's Hashkira, but I'm presenting a case, but I had to frame the question for a while to frame it correctly. What do I mean by life? Life means can DNA, this is what we did today. Life means can DNA come into existence by natural forces? And we prove today not only improbable, impossible. You know, it's funny, it's actually, I had a biology professor that, um, I had a biology professor that used. I, I need, I need sorry. sorry. No, 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 I'm sorry. I need to ask. Yeah, no, I, need to I, I was just saying, I had, a, I had a, uh, a biology professor that actually used this complication, this complexity. We were speaking specifically about how sight works. Like the, the, the mechanism by which site works, he's saying it's way too complicated. The site. Yeah, he's saying that the, the site is way too complicated. And, and it's such a messy process. If, if there was a guy, why would he make it so complicated? It must be simple. I was like, that's such a. And like, I. And he hasn't designed a single camera. That's. <laughs> by the way, this is one of my favorite professors ever. Like, one of my favorite lectures. Very, very intelligent individual. But it was in that moment that I completely lost all respect for him. And it was towards the end of the class. And I was just like, you literally had, there was no reason for you to bring that up. And you also looked. I think the thing that people find confusing is that God works in very, he takes very simple components. And that's why I've been saying that digital communication makes a lot of sense because complexity arises from complications. It arises from a lot of simple things strung together. And that's engineering. You literally take zeros and ones and make everything right you make everything from zeros and one it's not a complicated thing but the intelligent part is how to put it together to transfer information which is the key component in 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 intelligent design is yeah it's, it's the intelligent aspect it's not that the machinery itself is complicated like that that machinery behind the app it makes that right it is it has to work but it's not more complicated than it needs to be, it's exactly as complicated as 
I, as, as a natural physicist, you needed a big bang to get all this to happen. Anyway. So everything goes back to the big bang. So this is software for how you create life in the universe. But if you look at hardware software analogy, the, you needed the hardware for the software to function. So all you needed neutrinos, you needed particles, you get hydrogen, you get helium, and all that. So we go back in time, no framework to create the environment for this to happen to create software is kind of how I see things and put it in perspective. And, and that's what I call the, so an atheist will always go back and tell you it's about gaps. So we learned, so when we started with Galileo, you know, he had a simplistic view of, of how the solar system worked. Copernicus came along, then Newton's laws came, and every time at the end, when they could describe something, they said it's up to God. And then Einstein came and said, well, Newtonian laws are a function of space time gravity. So then you learn that, you keep going back. So every time, to your point, we learn the beauty of the universe, we learn the beauty of all this, it actually becomes simpler the more we understand it. And we, and that's the beauty of a, of a robust design. And the things we don't understand, we find complex, but the more, like Father Gregor was explaining this, it's simple when you think about it. It's, it is communication theory, which you study in the engineering classes. And it just gets, the simplicity just gets like, wow, it's pretty impressive. We just don't know enough. And that's, yeah, so and that's the whole thing. And, and you know, when I, I see all this and you stem it all back into what actually created the hardware for the software to function, this software is beautiful when you think about it. And it's and if you look at and we go on other top probably very now talk about statistics. I mean, the odds of this and the odds of you know, it's pretty, there has to be something. Is it, is it true that uh, I, I read it somewhere the difference between our DNA and human DNA? The difference in the human uh, between our DNA and the banana in the DNA is just slightly, nothing major that makes it that true. Well, I think I heard it's sixty percent. If somebody was making out of the three point two million, we'll get we'll get into the part of evolution that can we our origin to be banana, for example. But what the discussion of off today, which I wanted to get across, is that can this come on its own by itself? Sorry, can this come in existence by itself? That was the question I wanted to ask you. And I hope I give a case that biochemical predestination cannot formalize. So that the, the image that we said amino acids and forces and so on, can I build this? No, not because God built it, because it cannot be built, because if it has biochemical affinity, it will be a repetitious. Order. Randomness will discuss randomness, but it's very even, even um, Kenyan, even Kenyan said, he said, I found the Holy Grail, it's biochemical affinity in 1968, but he did not study uh, digital communication. He said, forming this by chance himself, he said, very unlikely. It's nothing concrete that can tell you it's formed by chance. And you know that DNA to replicate it needs polymerase. There's 15 types of polymerase in the human system, 15. And they're studying the plant one because it's like three or five to understand what polymerase does, which is copying the DNA. So it was there and it copied itself. I don't want to, to make it sarcastic, but I'm presenting a case here, the very important case of today, which is this picture. If you don't know the order, the forces cannot be it. We get this point, still then. To bring back up, um, so there's an icon in the Middle Ages called the teleological icon of the existence of God. And it's the idea that we can determine, like, we can see God's existence by the fact that there's a purpose set, like, there's an end goal set in creation. And the idea is that an end goal has to be set beforehand. And, like, in a case of like a message, like, I wish for Merry Christmas when it's spelled correctly, the idea of the goal is the meat, deliver the meat. And if it's DNA that matters, then the goal is to deliver the organism. And it's been set, you know, before the actual organism exists. So that's probably a lot of Very nice contemplation. But, but, but you and I know, and all of us know, when we discuss with atheists, we cannot mention God or purpose or anything. We have to mention the nuts and bolts they love to work on. But remember the very first picture, 
the advancements in genetics, which I, I need, I need somebody to teach me this. What's happening is used now as a conclusion that obliterates the nuts and bolts understanding of how life started. And what I wanted to do today is to follow scientists throughout history to describe how I can frame this question. Origin of life means origin of DNA existence. And today we said DNA existence cannot, not probably not, cannot happen by natural forces. And we'll stop there. Does that make sense? We'll stop here because I don't want to add anything extra. I guess we'll, the second part of the lecture is exempt. <laughs> you can go home and not meet again after half an hour because I think uh, we will do better advertisement for it. We'll summarize this in order to get onto the next part, which is the machinery for building amino acids and answering that information can never be from amino acid to DNA. Even if they said it came from amino acid, I'll prove that information cannot flow from amino acid to build the DNA. Cannot. Then I'm not the deep. It will become very, very, again, this type of, of proof or this type of discussion. Right. Yes. 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 And that, that that's scientific. Right. Right. And the word evolve. Once you put it anywhere, it's the magic word. If you put it anywhere, anything becomes scientific. Like if you have to, uh, this, we'll, we'll see examples without being sarcastic at all. Because again, this is an act of washing the feet. This is an act of respecting the thinking. The atheists are very very smart. And you have to present the case. You have to present the case that respects their intelligence. And this is what I practice with them is that, thank God, when I present this, they, they don't see it trivial. But they build the answer on what science will explain to us as explain to us things in the future that God used to cover. Now science explains it. But I'm treating you scientifically. I, I don't know what we're waiting for to scientifically show that this could be built. I was just saw the basic, the very basic thing. The very, very basic thing, natural forces has to be absent in the direction of information. And it will never be science in the future will prove it was present. Natural forces will never be present in the direction of information. So I don't want to be science to discover. I want this to be, but this is the cornerstone of, of so many strong arguments that it comes out of this to this point. So, okay, thank you very, very, very much. And um, this will be recorded. I will put in the chat question. Thank you. I uh, pressed escape, so I lost the presentations. Sorry, it's just the computer taking time to synchronize to the... No, let me read it because if it's embarrassing, I try to find a way to answer. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I want, I want to, to be embarrassed if it's because we all learn this way. Sorry? You want the presentation? Okay, I'll... Uh... I'll send it or I'll post it somewhere on our, I think I, we should post it on the COCC uh, website or the dome, the dome on the, this is under the dome, we can put it. Um, well, I'll, at least I'll post this part because there is, um, yeah, there's quite a bit of things in order to answer the randomness. And then we have to, I, I really love to respect, that's why I like to get into the debates because every time I get to the point and it makes the discussion solid and it makes, um, makes the argument is that they appreciate the respect of the thinking, and that's really a touch of love, not a touch of authority. Uh, it, it clicks with them that you respect the thinking, and they respect it back because they, they, they respond. This is actually truly uh, a solid argument. So it's just a which I'd love to have chat here. It's a and this I need to do something like uh, something simple like this. Huh? I don't see the chat on the top. Okay. 
topics and this. When you, when you connect the HDMI, it becomes weird. Um, okay. Sure. I think it's like 10 minutes to do this. That's great. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit. I ask you to give us the love and the patience and the temperament to deal with all those of your course, because it's a work that we enlightened by your love has to do. We have to be able to give an answer and give us a witness of humility. Give us all of this thinking and give us this love and also the importance of the patience to deal with these cases because it's hard to understand. Well, I've got the Father, the grace only the God, the Son of the Savior, Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, with you all. Whoever wants to go, go in peace, and the peace of God will surpass his own understanding and protect your hearts and minds of Christ. Go in peace, and the peace of God will be all. Thank you all so much. My pleasure, my pleasure. Let us pray for anybody who is thought.